What's up, guys? Welcome to another episode of the Always Race Day podcast. I don't know what number this is, and we're recording two tonight, hopefully, so I really don't know which number this is going to be, but it is another episode, and again, it is presented by the fine folks at the Carl Auto Group. If you're looking for a car to get you up to the Cyhawk game on Saturday, to get you to the Boone Super Nationals, get you to uh, the World of Outlaws uh, Gold Cup Race of Champions or the Tuscarora 50 this weekend, um, this is the Asphalt Podcast. I just reference every dirt race going on in the world, and not the World 100. But if you need a car, so I hope if you need a car to get you somewhere, call the Carl Auto Group. They'll set you up. They'll get it to you quickly, cleanly, and coolly. How's that? I hope everybody knows that if you go to Carl Auto Group and you buy a four cylinder, you could probably take it to Boone and not get disqualified. So. They'll they'll sell you a, a legal car. Caleb, you would be the one that would be the closest um, person to me that that knows how much I play PlayStation racing games. If I rolled up in a four cylinder to a heat race at Boone at the Super Nationals, do you think I could place in the top eight? Well, is your motor legal? Because right now, yes, that's what everybody's been dealing with there. Oh, ah, can I – what if I had a super illegal motor in there but past tech? Well, it doesn't sound like you're going to this year. I'm not – I'm completely not above it if that's if that's what we're putting me in. it. Uh, I've, I've heard some things. I unfortunately have not been able to go to Boone yet, but um, I've heard some things that they're finally teching – those four cylinder motors after years of it being out of control. What I hate, what I hate about, and this is probably something I got to get on into more on a dirt podcast is just the inconsistencies of the tech shed. And I don't want a tech shed rookie superstar that is sitting there with a WWE championship belt, telling everyone to suck it. Cause he sits there and tears the part of car for four hours and then says, here, put it back together for me. I, I don't want that. You know, there's a fine line. We've had that discussion. But damn, make it consistent. That's that's the least anyone can ask for. And if you're sitting here as a NASCAR fan going like, those dirt hillbillies don't know what they're talking about. Well, NASCAR sees that Hendrick cheated on something. They want to send a message to Hendrick this week. So they make the Hendrick cars the uh, the random uh, take these two to the R&D this week. So don't tell me that that doesn't happen in NASCAR. The same stuff happens. It's just egos and, and shit like that. And I... I hate that aspect of of everything like that but uh yeah we got we got some good stuff to talk about yeah let's get into it kyle larson uh wins darlington and man like dude's just good uh basically put on a clinic after denny hamlin i I don't know let's talk that first actually denny hamlin's dominating the race Seems like no one's going to pass any Hamlin. Larson couldn't pass any Hamlin on the track. And that goes back to my hatred of this car that I've completely hypocrisized myself on. Um, but Hamlin comes in the pits saying he has a loose wheel. His team looked around, could not find anything that would indicate that the wheel was loose in any way. Uh, but even after hearing that, Hamlin tells his team on the radio, no, it was loose, um, but it Cost him a win that clinches his spot into uh, the quarterfinal round. I was very shocked uh, for any driver to do that, let alone Denny Hamlin. Yeah, but if you think about it too, if if you think that it's loose, you come down pit road. I agree. I do agree. I do agree with that. You still have you know the chance to fight in the playoffs. Where if it is loose and you don't come to pit road and then you crash then you're, you know, in a whole different position. So, um, you know, it's hard to tell. It might, you know, could be what ends up maybe winning him the championship down the road. We'll have to tell. But, yeah, I I, I think, you know, Denny's a veteran driver where he understands and the crew chief understands might as well come down and, you know, finish middle of the pack or, you know, have the opportunity to get back towards the front. But if you crash, then you don't have that opportunity at all. Yeah. And I, and I do agree with that aspect. Um, I just wonder what specifically was causing 
whatever he felt um, to get him to drive all the way to pit road. I mean, it, it just, it was puzzling to me. And otherwise, um, it, actually, let's kind of go in on, on a tangent here too. What did you guys think of the race? Because I was not as intrigued as I usually am watching a Darlington race. And I don't know if this like recency bias of my take on the car is something that I need to address in my own personal head. I've had a long, long week of uh, personal stuff. Everyone's okay. Everything has worked out. That, but I missed a podcast for Iowa State site this week because of it. And uh, it has been rough, but I'm fine. Everyone else is fine. Uh, it just, it did not feel like it was that exciting of a race. And it felt like whoever was the leader had a massive advantage on second. And that's exactly what we hated with the 550 package. So I was interested in what you guys thought and don't take my opinion and make yours less one way or the other. Well, it's, it's kind of a fine line. So what we've seen in past Darlington races has been like, it's been next to the top five races of the year for the season. But this year, like you said, like it just didn't seem like we're not necessarily saying it's a bad race, but it just didn't seem like your typical Darlington playoff race. Like last year, anything and everything happened that would just solidify why it was such a good race. Like the Kyle Busch motor incident under yellow, the, the leaders wrecking, like it was just one of those deals that it was such a good race that it's hard to back it up. So people had high expectations and then they just didn't really get met. I mean, I definitely agree with like what Connor said too, about it's almost like it was like the 550 package deal. And we really didn't see the top five change hands throughout the night. Like it was the same people kind of the entire night um, there's a little bit of, you know, people that struggled once night came and, and stuff like that. But yeah, it pretty much was kind of the same players that had the same speed the entire night, except for the people like Denny Hamlin that, you know, had to take themselves out of it and, and stuff like that. So, um, yeah, I mean, to me, it just, it wasn't like a super duper exciting race just from that aspect where yeah it seemed like you couldn't pass you saw a lot of like dive bombs um you know which we occasionally see but it seemed like the guys were more aggressive in you know trying to send it down into the corner um because you just couldn't pass and a lot of those came from guys that weren't going for the lead and i think that's a big aspect from it and if you're a playoff driver going against a non-playoff like I, I don't think anyone threw like a really bad dive bomb. I think Bubba Wallace did on Joey Logano, but obviously he apologized and everyone came out of it. All right. Um, but yeah, even Denny is, he's still plus 27 uh, for the playoffs for the cutoff. So obviously it wasn't that big of a mistake. There was enough chaos around that. It like kept me intrigued for sure. Ricky Stenhouse junior uh, battling back from being a lap down for like the first 75% of the race was pretty cool to watch. Um, and we didn't really see most of it, but he, you know, you know, he's just sitting there riding and hoping for the right break and finally got it. But I mean, it's not even cause of long strung out green flag runs. It's just the race didn't have the passing for the lead that I'm accustomed to, especially at Darlington, especially at a track where stuff just happens to people. And I don't know. It just, it just, and it wasn't bad. It just wasn't really good. But that's the thing too. Like I, I, again, I, I agree. Typically the things that we see at like a Darlington are, you know, the guys that are fast during the day aren't usually fast when it comes to night. Um, the long runs, you know, if we don't have cautions, typically those guys that are good on the short runs aren't as good on the long runs. Once the tires burn out and everything, you know, that's where you generate the passing because guys save their tires or save their brakes and they're able to pass later in the run. Just none of that exists with this car slash package so, you know, those things that, yeah, typically do generate passing and make for a good race where 
oh, you know, Chris Buescher was super fast during the day, but then once night fell, he was 15th. Or we went the final run of 100 laps, and Martin Truex Jr. was super fast, but then, you know, he burnt all his tires off. Like, we just don't see that with this car. Yeah, I completely agree. Also, how how the hell did Ross Chastain weasel his way into what he did? That, that's just such bullshit. Like, he was trashed the entire day, and then all of a sudden, late in the race, it's like, oh, the car figured out how to go. I think as a track house whole, they figured it out. Because even Suarez was pretty awful. Because Chastain was, what, first car one lap down, and Suarez was the last car in the lead lap at the end of stage one. And if it wasn't for the uh, the Alex Bowman block, Suarez was right there in the top 10. And then obviously Chastain finished where he did. And talking about that too, I have a huge problem with Bowman. Oh yeah, um, let's I, do that. No, oh, no, no, no. I, I, I'm going to love to hear this because I'm going to fire I have, a, I have a couple problems with what he said and slash did. Um, so first off, I, just a, a, a dumb block. I mean, just a stupid, stupid block. And it's it's one thing that you're going to go all the way down, you know, and try to block him as far down as he did. But then Suarez comes back and Bowman tries to come back again. And dumb block. Okay, we've seen that before. Dumb moves happen. You know, everybody does them. But the issue that I really, really have is he goes on TV and he says he never lifted. Every time I'm around him, he does something stupid, talking about Suarez, and he just drove right through me. But then he gets on Twitter and says, oh, just a dumb block, my bad, you know, blah, 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 blah. And now he maybe saw a replay and learned and whatever. Yeah. But I mean, come on, you, you can't throw that stupid of a block. I, I look at it like the IndyCar rules. IndyCar rules are you can move once. You can't move twice. He made a stupid block once and NASCAR didn't have to step in on the second block because Bowman wrecked himself on the second block. But then to get out and to blame Suarez and say, well, he didn't let off. I'm sorry, but if you're going to block me that aggressively for, I mean, where were they? 11th? I mean, it was like. It, yeah, it wasn't know, 24th like Dan DiOrio from Barstool said. It was not 24th. It was 8th. They're racing for 8th. Yeah, it was like right right in there. But it wasn't like they were battling for first, second, third, you know. And there was still a decent well, well, time Hold on, time out, I, time out, because I, I love calling out hypocrisy. I just want to know where, and I'm going to keep you consistent on this, where's your line where you can throw a stupid block? If I'm in fourth, can I throw one? And I'm, kind I, of, I'm, I'm half giving you shit, Caleb. Is. Don't take, and I hope no one else takes this like I'm coming after yeah. Caleb. Because what I'm going to say is going to be an unpo- unpopular thing, but yeah. I think there's a point in the race where, sure, you can throw that block for 11th, but I, it, it wasn't that late in the race for that, and there there just wasn't anything for it. Suarez or Bowman are in the playoff. Like, there just – there was not a good reason to throw that deep of a block. And if you're going to do it, do it one way. But, again, you, you can't do it two ways because it's just – at that point, if you're going to make that stupid of a move, why is it Suarez's – duty to let off you know and so yeah i just i I thought that was crazy but then to get out and and really blame suarez and you know tell him he should have lifted i just thought was asinine and i didn't specifically uh see bowman's comments uh either right after whatever i might have gone to the bathroom i don't know uh bad preparation on my work but uh i so i thought that suarez got into the back of him uh, and then I watched the replay and it looked a little dumber for Alex. I still think he got into him a little bit and that's what caused Alex to get so far to the left. And the whole time he was thinking, I got to get back up to the right for turn one entry. Um, that's educated guess, just my, just my deal. So tear me apart. I don't really care. Uh, but I think that if you're going to judge someone from the 
heat of the battle, like post race, right after they get out of the car. Here's my thoughts. This is this. And then they look at the replay and they change their mind. I think that the angry Twitter mob needs to get off their horseshoe on that. I don't even, I'm combining uh, phrases of uh, catchphrases or phrases of speech or whatever the hell that word is too. Uh, But I I just think like, yeah, once you see the replay, you're going to think probably something different than what you thought in the heat of the moment. And I think people need to take that context and think about that. But I, I also just see people on NASCAR Twitter just spotlighting like, oh, look at th- this account. It's tweeting this stupid thing. Like, I'm going to put them on blast. And it's like, you're just giving them attention. Like, I think it's dumb. But, you know, just another uh, just another incident. Probably a move, probably a move Bowman wants back. Caleb, you're chopping again. Hold on. Now talk. Or not. I disappear. <laughs> I think I think something's happening on Caleb's end of the phone. Are you good? Caleb's gonna make an angry phone call soon. That was is, we're being haunted by Caleb, Josh. He's living in our walls. That's that's the audio quality that all those ghost hunting TV shows gave us for years. How right, is well, that better? There, oh, there we go. All right, go. Go for it. <laughs> I don't remember what I was going to say. Let's, we'll just move on. All right. <laughs> Quit shitting on Bowman. No, I'm kidding. Uh, no. Uh, <laughs> full disclosure, I'm buddies with his photographer. I got friends I root for. Uh, he's a fantastic person. That's it, probably some bias in my judgment of if Suarez hit him in the back. I don't know if he did. Use your judgment, use yours. I'm not mad about it. I'm not anything about it. So uh, as far as the playoffs go, some kind of a couple of things I'll point out. I don't think people want to hear me list the 16 drivers and where they're at. Uh, But William Byron is plus 45. I'm pretty sure him and Martin Truex Jr. were either tied or plus one off one another going into this race. Martin Truex is plus 25, 20 points behind William Byron. That is a bad day for Martin Truex Jr. And that is not how you're going to advance in these playoffs. Yeah, I mean, it's it was quite the flip, in my opinion, for the regular season champ. Well, and it could have been very different, too, because for a while we thought he might win the race too like there there was a moment there where we were like oh well well, Truex is gonna go on to win this thing but yeah it's I mean it can switch very quickly yeah absolutely obviously uh Larson is on the next round uh Tyler Reddick's plus 30 uh and then in fourth place uh with it's just miraculous Chris Buescher is plus 27 Brad Keselowski is an eighth plus 18 on the cutoff That RFK team made a complete turnaround from last year, and it's showing right now, and we got the rest of the playoffs to talk about this. I think we we might be overreacting a little bit because we're doing like one show a week right now, and we'll get back on the schedule. Uh, Like I said, it's that personal stuff that kind of interrupted things, and I apologize to everyone, but at the same time, I don't. (laughs) Uh, But RFK... And what they've been able to do and get off to a start like this has got to be really confidence building uh, for everyone in that building. Yeah, I mean, it has. When Brad took over, like I did not expect, you know, them to become this successful this quickly. And really just in the last couple races, they have just hit on something. And it is I think we talked about this on the last podcast, but I mean, it's they covered just about every track type now that they are good at. So uh, it's not just like they're going to the speedways or the super speedways or the short tracks or the road courses. Like they're, they're hitting it at every single track. Well, we haven't seen a team really do that this year, in my opinion. Um, I thought AJ Allmendinger is a surefire lock for a road course W. He obviously didn't get there. Um, you know, you look at, teams uh that are usually good at super speedways and we've still seen different winners there 
And it, it's just really been sporadically spread out. And I think that says a lot about Chris Buescher to be able to do what he does. And he kind of gives me like a Greg Biffle feel. Like he's an all right talent. He's going to win a race here and there. Maybe Biffle won a little more uh, than he has to this point in his career. Not career total wise, but like average wins on a season or something like that. Um, but he kind of flies under the radar. You know, I'm old, old enough, I guess, to remember when him and his brother were in the truck series and they were going to be the next Dylan twins. And we were just going to have not twins, siblings. Uh, we were just going to have like families dominating the cup series. And that was kind of assumed, but, uh, no, I really like what they're, uh, building there. And, uh, I think we do need to talk about the bubble. The playoff bubble is very interesting for this first round. Joey Logano's plus three, Christopher Bell is plus one. And then Bubba Wallace is the first one on the outside, minus one. Kevin Harvick's minus two. Stenhouse is minus four. Uh, and McDowell's down there in minus 19. I don't, I don't foresee Michael McDowell getting out of this round, but maybe he'll lead every lap of the next race and fall into victory land. I have no clue. That, that dude's – that dude and when he – gets on and when he starts when races confuses me so much it doesn't make any sense Caleb Caleb is Caleb is an alien again mm. so what what are you asking about with McDowell I was sending an email out for oh no you're good I, Michael McDowell's minus 19 I don't think he's going to advance to the next round but every time Michael McDowell does really well in a race I'm like there's no way that, that guy is even going to touch the top 10 today yeah not that I, I not that I go into every race thinking that but like everyone says like oh this guy's really good at road courses and it's like well I, I'm looking at this it says one career top five Oh God, Caleb could go on. That was that was that. like a year ago when I look when that came up. But yeah, it's it's just it, he confuses me at what tracks he goes and sometimes he'll he'll just go and dominate or look really really good for a period of the race and then you know the results might not show it or the results might reflect it and I'm still confused every time. Yeah, for a hot minute there, Michael McDell had us convinced that that he could be up there and maybe move on to the next round or hell, maybe even the round after that. But after kind of what I see is from Darlington is pretty much once you're front row, you're always front row. Like you, there's no team that I'd like to succeed more than probably front row as the small of a team that they are. But that's ultimately going to be your downfall because they just don't have what everyone else has. And they have these inconsistent glimpse of they should have. I I don't even like front row motorsports employed Landon castle and then said, you didn't do good enough. So we're not hiring you again, which like talk about talent judgment. I don't think they have it there. I just don't. And part of that's Landon castle part of that's Todd Gillen. There's a lot more. Um, I'm just scratching the surface there. If anyone from front row is pissed at me, send me a message. Give me – defend yourself. I, I will give you a yeah, – I'll, I'll have team. you on here. Um, I don't think front row is, is a great judge of talent, but they should have more resources at front row motors, motorsports than Roush Fenway Keslowski has. This is going to send you through a tizzy because who has more wins at Knoxville, Todd Gilliland or Landon Castle? Does Landon Castle have a start at Knoxville? Probably not. Yeah, so he's undefeated, not. right? Ty Gillen's undefeated. Did, well, did he not race the second time? No. Shit. All right. One for no, well, no, so, I can't argue that. I can't argue that. So he No, no. Oh, he, I was by the way, I was, was saying I was saying Todd Gillen was good. That I was trying to say they should have him full time not splitting six races with another guy where he has to go drive for Rick Ware for six weekends of the year. That's what I was saying about, I, I think Todd Gilliland is a talent. I just want that clear. Cause I just realized that that could have came off the opposite way. Um, actually Todd Gilliland won the second year. It was the first year that he didn't race. Cause it was Donnie shots. Donnie shots didn't win the first year. No, I'm saying that in the 17 truck. He was damn close. He got taken out by that guy in the Napa 19. 
Yeah, yeah. yeah. Him and everybody else that race. Yeah, yeah that, that was the – you could not – if you didn't shit on Derek Krause that night, I don't know if you watched the race. Like everybody that I know that watched it was asking me, what got into that guy? And it's, it's dirt. He's probably, you know, he hasn't raced a ton of dirt stuff. Like, it just shit happens, man. Like, and I don't hate Derek Krause either. So we got to be careful with who we shit on on here. Um, not really. Mind, not, not really, but. Keep, keep in mind, though, we're talking about the team that also jumped, dumped John Hunter Nemechek as well. That's right. John Hunter Nemechek today. Uh, kind of breaking news. It happened like an hour ago. Uh, he is going to Legacy uh, next year, drive the uh, 42 car full time. I thought that was a big pickup. He went down to the truck series uh, with something to prove. He had to prove it while he was down there. I thought he did. Um, whether you think he got, you know, should have won a title for sure. I, I think he should have won a title too, but there's a lot of dumb racers in the truck series and sometimes you get taken out by some of them. So I, uh, I love John Hunter Nemechek. I think he's at the very least, I mean, he's going to improve that car. That's for sure. They're leaving Chevy. They don't have the same Chevy equipment that everyone else has personal opinion. I don't attack me if you don't think Chevy's doing that, but they're getting out of that. Um, so once they get to Toyota, I think they're going to have, and Toyota has a chip on its shoulder too. They want, they are probably the most competitive of the manufacturers right now, in my opinion, uh, in the places that they're set up and getting Denny Hamlin locked in for next year was a big part of that. But uh, I do really think that their season next year could be a lot different, especially with John Hunter Nemechek behind the wheel. That's one of the best off-season pickups I think I've seen. Yeah, I mean, I don't agree with you. All right, I do agree with you. On oh, that that's point. good. Okay. Because oh. if you had <laughs> like that and then went into like how I was stupid, I would be kind of puzzled. I, <laughs> um, I don't know how – well he's going to do like it'll be very interesting to see um i think toyota will probably be a big backer of him so they'll want him to be in good equipment i'm gonna guess that's probably how that's gonna go um and it will be very interesting i was surprised at how well carson hosevar did in that car this weekend um so i think we kind of know that that team has more speed than what they've had this year um Poor and that kind of shows a little bit about some people that have been in those cars but um you, yeah, don't, come be- on, come on. no no i want i do want to ask you about this don't it, i'm not fighting you on this this is not a debate this is caleb's biggest fault is he has so much emotion and i love it so much because he he feels one way <laughs> or the other about a certain guy and he's not going to budge on it do you think, do you agree with me that the teams leaving a manufacturer and changing it for next year have slower cars this year because that manufacturer manufacturer is less invested in their teams because they know they're on the way out? Yes, but I do you think they're, they're, do you think they reserve Kevin Harvick as a driver that would not be affected because they don't want to tarnish any legacy he might have? This is all tinfoil hat. This is not reporting. I do not know anything. That's don't hold me to any of this. This is all tinfoil hat. Just questions we're talking about. I don't understand how we got Kevin Harvick. In Kevin Harvick. Harvick's Kevin Harvick's performance has not dropped off. I think the Stuart Haas racing team as a whole has dropped off this season even more so than in years past, and they haven't been great. Um, and there's reason to believe that Ford is not going to be their manufacturer for next year as well uh and how bad uh legacy motor club has been this year with the resources they have with the people running jimmy johnson is not stupid and i'm not insinuating that caleb said he was but they've also not had great performances this year do you think there is any weight on manufacturers getting out of teams and those cars being slower naturally and Carson Hosevar still, it might even say more to Carson Hosevar's performance. I would say, if you're factoring in uh, my thoughts there, uh, it might even say more to Carson Hosevar's performance and how well he was able to do with it. Well, and I'm going to raise you that too, where, okay, if we say, because I, here's what I'll say I, I think it's definitely a possibility. But what I'll say is, if you look and you say, okay, without the manufacturer help, we'll call it, that shows how good Carson Hosevar is. 
let's put Harvick in that same situation because yeah, yeah, I would I say Harvick is probably, you know, 10 times the driver that Josefar is, but just, you know, because he, he is very good and he's been around forever and ever. So yeah, it's, it's hard. It, it could definitely be a possibility, but you also just have to look and you look at the caliber of a driver that Harvick is. I mean, I would put him top five in the current cup field. So I would expect, yeah, he, he could, you know, take a car that's not so great and be running, you know, pretty solid with it still. I, and yeah, and I don't disagree with that. I do think a guy that looks in his rearview mirror and sees a blue and yellow paint scheme and drives the car straight into a wall oh, might not be the driver that we think he is, but he's done good this year. He's doing good. And I, you know, I applaud him on his way out. No, I'm kidding. That was, that was Chase Elliott fan. I'm trying to play a character a little bit sometimes, but I try not to, uh, come off like a total douchebag when I do it. And I was doing it there. So, uh, but yeah, I, I do think there's truth to all that. Not essentially the bias thing and, and all that stuff, but talent wise for these drivers. Um, and there's guys that are showing a lot and it's just interesting. It's, um, just something that I, I like to look at and numbers and stuff that it kind of makes sense why things would go this way or the other, but yeah, great performance all year from Harvick and probably a better one from not, not driver talent better, but probably better expectation wise than uh, Carson Hosovar to do what he's done that car so far. So are we good on NASCAR? We got Kansas and Bristol coming up. Uh, Bubba obviously won there in the past. What, what did your eyes get all big, Caleb? I don't know, Jack. Did I say Martinsville or did I say Bristol? Did I say the wrong thing? You said Kansas. Kansas and Bristol. Yeah. I might have said Martin. I, I feel like I said Martinsville, but go ahead, Josh. I do have something about Kansas. Um, I saw this floating around Twitter. I'll show it to the screen. So that is the Sheldon Creed car for this weekend at Kansas being prepped in the RCR camp. So that's a BJ as, Cloud number. I just want that on, on the record. That was a seven yes. car you showed me. Yes, so Sheldon Creed racing for BJ McLeod will be in the coming out of the RCR shop. So there's this, potential this is for that, that car. This is Cole Custer in an SS green light car. It's the only Xfinity winner at California. You guys were ready for Custer plus 2000 day? Yes. But so yeah, we, so we put a flyer on Sheldon Creed in the BJ McLeod 78. Oh boy. Um, in top five. May we find, find that on DraftKings? Bet Rivers. I'm in the Bet Rivers college football contest. I've never cared more about my bets. It's the worst thing ever. But there's so I thought that was interesting, but also not really surprising. But there's one thing that I do find surprising is the 77 car is also being prepped in the RCR shop, which if you kind of noticed a little bit, that car has shown more than 35th place speed the last couple weeks. So it makes you wonder if that car has been how long that car has been being prepped in that shop. I'm going to ask a dumb question. Who drives that car? Ty Dillon. <laughs> <laughs> oh no. Uh, you yeah. just embarrass yourself on the podcast. Hey, well, no, I was no, about I, to bring him up anyways. I let you talk. I got to interrupt Caleb Moore now. <laughs> I just embarrassed Ty Dillon because I I watch NASCAR almost every week, and if I don't know what car you're in, that's a you problem, not a me problem. Uh, no, there, I think I think if someone listens to this, I'm going to get a message and say, "What what is Caleb thinking? That he doesn't know Ty Dillon? Are you kidding me?" Even even worse, Josh. What's my favorite number? Seventy seven. Yeah, that's just on. Yeah, you. I don't know. I mean, no. Yeah, I think you just. Also lost the, uh, I think you just lost the debate on the Suarez Bowman thing. No, <laughs> no, because I'm with him on it. Oh shit! Okay, I mean that's the time. Yeah, so. <laughs> All right, uh, real quick, we're gonna talk IndyCar. The championships locked up. Alex Pillow clinched it. Uh, we talked about the blocking rules. I wanted to ask you guys what you thought of IndyCar's consistency. On was it Pillow that blocked twice? That, mm -hmm. that was, and I'm not a guy who advocates for blocking penalties, 
I don't like that. I think it's racing. I think you find a way around somebody. Um, but that's also coming from a closed stock car, closed wheel background. Um, but that was the most obvious effing block I've seen in my entire life. I, there is not, there is not a block that looked more deliberate than Alex Pelos looked on whoever the hell was passing. I can't even remember. I was shocked they didn't penalize that. And I believe it was Ryan Hunter Ray. I'm not 100 percent sure. Nope, that sounds correct. But yeah, I, yeah, I, I was shocked. I saw everyone else's tweets, and yeah, go shit on I, race, go shit on race control because that, that was just bad. I was I was left speechless. I was, and I'm mad because I could have got an Aaron McLaren dub, but no, it's fine. I'm not mad at all. There's no way for me to actually do this, but I want to blame Zach Brown for it on your behalf. Thanks. I can't add anything because I didn't see it. Um, but I. It yeah, was it I, was a double block situation, but looked even more obvious than the. I, I I jumped up and I started screaming for joy because I thought they were, they were gonna call it, and then Dave came over and said that they didn't even look at it. Like, not in the fact that they were like, oh, we looked at it, no action necessary. They didn't even bother to look at it. Yeah, and that makes it worse. Like, I, I think referees should have to be held to their um, explanations for things. I think they should have to answer questions in whatever sport you're talking about. And racing is no different. Um, and there should have been a statement. And for that to get out that you didn't even look at it, how irresponsible are you to – have to allow someone to say that you didn't even look at it because you just drew double the criticism on that whether you are of the opinion on one way or the other you just drew double the criticism from the people on the other side because you said you didn't even look at it that's just stupid. it's a stupid move i don't care if you looked at it or not why college football coaches chris has chris williams has been on this take for the last three and a half weeks and i completely agree with him but college football coaches lie all the time Press releases lie all the time. You see a press release that says, I'm sorry for this, 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 and that. They might be lying. Who knows? Who knows who even wrote that? And I, I don't know why people like to pick those statements apart. But my goodness, don't say you didn't look at it. That's the easiest lie you can tell in the book. Oh, we looked at it. Didn't find anything. At least, I, I at least then you have an opinion out there that's like, okay, well, this is our judgment. You can use yours. Yeah, I I don't know. I, uh, There's some people that I, don't even like that I said that because, it, yeah, I, I, I get you so, want them to be truthful with you. I, I completely understand that, but they're not. No one, said, no organization is always going to be truthful with you. I promise you. Caleb is now in the loop because I sent the clip to him, so uh, he can now yeah. express his thoughts. The one thing I'm going to say is like, we've definitely seen. If you don't the- shit on Alex Pillow more than you shit on Alex Bowman today. I, I'm going to be very pissed off when we get off the camera. No, because one of them didn't have contact. Oh, jeez. No. They're open wheel racing. I, I, think, I think we've definitely seen penalties come from IndyCar on less egregious blocks. I agree. Uh, what? God, what was it? There was one like last year, I think, that was like really bad. I, there's been a couple in the past that you are like, just, so bad. You can't just bring up one and not, not give me contact. I don't remember who it was, but then who was it too? It was like Rosenquist had one last year. I think that was bad. I think that was at Toronto. Wasn't there like it was something like Castro Neves to willpower or something? It was like where they they penalized him for blocking a teammate, and it wasn't even like that big of a block. Like there's there's been some in the past that are like, what are you even penalizing this person for? And then they're not going to do that one. That's definitely a problem. Wasn't there one or there was one earlier in the race too, with Kyle Kirkwood where all like he, all he did was run someone up the track. Like granted he ran him like to the grass, but they were clear, but, and then they gave him a two position penalty for it. And then you have a double block, not just a singular block, a double block and don't even bother to look at it. And I, I'm, a, I'm just going to assume that IndyCar didn't want to affect the championship. But, like, 
shit like that you have to call for one and two. Like, you're getting, you're entertaining the crowd. Because if you penalize him, Scott Dixon's battling for the lead. And if Scott Dixon wins and you penalized Polo, now you're going to the final race where who knows what happens. And it's just going to be, like, more people are going to end up tuning in for the finale. But I don't think I don't think you I I think both of those sides are wrong. Like I don't think you can say let's not penalize him because he's got such a big points advantage, and you can't say let's penalize him because then it'll make it more exciting for next week. I think you have to just say I don't care where you're at in the points, first, fifth, tenth, twentieth. I think you say hey, you threw two blocks. That's against the rules you are penalized it yeah and like i agree like agree completely i just think i'm just assuming that their thought process was that they didn't want to influence the championship and yeah and and don't assume that but that is actually okay never mind i'm completely going back on what i just said to you because i that's my fucking mind for you guys uh i yeah i i would agree that that probably would have come in naturally humans are all biased that's a a thing that exists, studies have been done. Um, and that's probably a thought that occurred in whoever's, whoever was making that call, that's probably a thought that occurred in their head. On the record, I'd completely agree. You shouldn't care about TV ratings. You shouldn't care about what next week's race is gonna look like. You shouldn't care what point or what spot somebody is in the championship. Off the record, uh, we can make next week a banger and really penalize this dude who's been dominant. He's gonna have his worst race of the year and the title is gonna be that much closer and we're going to have another outside shot for scott dixon to win his seventh yeah freaking do it and penalize the guy get some tv ratings that's what indycar needs do that shit boys please and, but, and this is where your f1 slander can come into play because f1 decided to do that in 2021 they, they do let... dude they do that oh, oh, are you talking about the finale in 21 yeah I am. No, they called that right. That's the only race they've ever called no, right in their entire right. race history. No, they did not call that right. Oh, because should, okay, okay, well, you can pit or you don't get to pit, and they shouldn't be impeded by lap cars in front of them. So Okay, but when that's your rule for the fucking 10-plus years before that, and you've called it that way every other time, why change that now? Because there's circumstances involved. It's a championship race. There's two guys who are that tight. And ple- and I don't and want any lap cars getting in the fucking way of them. I want them to race it out. I want them to race it out with no... I want them to race the it out with no variables. We just talked about. That's exactly what we're talking about. They did that to impede with the championship to make it more entertaining. That's not to make it. That's fair. I don't want to. La- I don't want Nicholas Latifi accidentally turning left to influence if Lewis Hamilton or Max Verstappen can't race against each other. I want them to race against each other. I'd I'd go as far as to say take the other it's eighteen cars like off the damn the racetrack crowd. and let those drive. They this get is it, hilarious. Right? This race still like that, and that's the mystique of F one. the one damn thing they did right in the last seventeen years. Is still because they weren't doing it before. race that was exciting. They weren't doing it before. That's the problem I have. If they did that before, and that's how they always called it, it wouldn't be a problem. But because they I didn't can, do that before, that's my, case, that's, that's my point on case by case basis things. Is it, in that race, in those circumstances, I'd rather have those guys be able to race it out with no lap traffic in front of them. Okay, I think it's stupid lap traffic lines up in front of them, anyways. But in those circumstances, they shouldn't be hindered by other cars and they should do everything in their power to make it a fair fight against one another. And I thought they did. I think you, if you're going to make that decision, you have the lap cars uh, pass the leader before the pit stops. Yeah, and instead of that's after. Yeah, and, and that's fair. We're, we're arguing logistics of things at this point. <laughs> but I, I'm also a guy that I breeds chaos and loves like I, I would operate under a no rule book league if I could honestly because I, I think everything should be taken by well, what happened here what do we got what's our decision blah 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 uh no but last thing uh before we go um I wanted to ask you guys so my my f1 friend if you're an Iowa State fan you'll know, know who I'm talking about they come up to me and they say 
Did you see the big news from today? Carlos Sainz, he, he got the pull. He's P1. He's going to start first. And it's, it's the biggest news of the day, and I'm so excited. It was so cool hearing about it and, and seeing the clips. It was so sweet. And I'm just like, well, does this mean that I can victory parade lap a Club Ray Hall second pull of the season for Graham Ray Hall? Because I will. I, I will run around here and party in the club with my other Graham Ray Hall fans, and specifically not Caleb, uh, on the podcast. And I, I just wanted to do that. Suck it, Caleb. We started first. Don't I don't even care what the race results said. Didn't look at them at all. I only care about who starts in the poll. Why did they decide the poll already for F1? It was last it, it was last week's race. For Monza, yeah. Got you. Okay. Did I say come up to me today? I'm tripping on my words tonight. Sorry. No, you're good. I might have just not understood that, but I got you. So any, any response to Graham Ray Hall getting another pull, uh, despite the equipment that he's in? Uh, yeah, still couldn't back it up with a win. Not even a top 10. He won the pull. He won in a Not even a top 10. For it. He, I, I Wait, think he didn't get a bonus. He, hey, last time he got the pull, didn't he also not end up getting a top 10? I don't know. I don't look at race results. I, I only care about qualifying. I'm an F1. Yeah. You know, if, listen... Next year, IndyCar, why even run the race? We're just going to have qualifying, and the points are going to be based off of qualifying. I will give you anyone that isn't Alex Polo or Scott Dixon. Pick someone who has more pulls than Graham Ray Hall in 2024 today, and we'll put 100 bucks on it. So next year? You can, you can wager less. You can wager like five. I don't – not wagering yeah, anything but- because – Doing it where often. you do the, the results based off of qualifying, it's stupid. So I guarantee Scott McLaughlin gets more pulls than Graham Ray Hall. That'd be like a good bet, Josh. I didn't want to bet you because I knew that you would pick a sensible pick and Caleb would dance his way out of it. No, because that's the dumbest <laughs> thing ever. The, the sentence, I don't look at race results. <laughs> so, now, you know, now you know what I'm thinking for some of these. That's, like, that's literally like after Daytona 500, we say, "Oh, there's your champion. Everybody, go home. Have a great weekend." We'll I just, you. I just think it's silly oh, that F1 because their races have been so goddamn boring has profited on excitement in the series qualifying on Saturday. It is nuts to me. It is, it's like the NBA and having all their players act like five year olds that have never interacted with other people before. And the whole off season is just like, well, what's this guy saying? What? Why is this guy torn with this team? And the off season is more exciting than the regular season. It, it confuses the hell out of me. Um, but I'll stay in my lane on the racing stuff, and I, I will still watch the Lakers. And as long as LeBron doesn't trade any more of my favorite guys, because you're what what's happening is you're trying to make it exciting for people, but you still have those traditionalists that you're also trying to please and you know they can't just say oh well the nba is actually boring so let's just completely change the nba yeah no, say, that's, and that's fair and they've done a great job of their like other leagues should follow what the nba has done off the court in a marketing direction of we're just gonna hyper focus on outfits guys were to the track you know or to the arena, obviously. Or, or like the like three D technology that they do, essentially, like constantly trying to draw attention. What are you? Oh, the NBA's three D, or are you talking about F one's three D technology? No, no. Uh, NBA's has some like three D technology, and then they have like some fiat like thing that like. Are you sure it's three like, D tech? Are you sure you're using? I don't know. I don't even know what you're talking about. I'm I'm probably not using the correct term, but... We're going to get laughed out of the room by NBA fans on this show. That's okay. We'll be all right. Josh, are you looking it up violently right now? Yes. I I can wait for you, but we can end the show. I don't care either way. (laughs) (laughs) I, I feel like I know, like, you're talking about, like, when the ball goes out of bounds and stuff like that, or... No, they uh, they came out with something, and I don't remember what it was, but it was like baffling to me. I don't remember it. 
I just remember Adam Silver doing like this big old presentation about it. But anywho, that's okay. Besides, okay. besides basketball talk. Yeah. I uh, no, but I don't think there's any good way to wrap that up. Uh, the NBA has done a great job of marketing off the court. Uh, I don't know content, player value, player personality, stuff like that. They they do a fantastic job of, out of that, and I think leagues should pick up and follow it. Uh, F1 has tripped everyone into thinking they're doing the same, and I'm not buying into it. Caleb is just math facing me. That's cool. No, we're good. Uh, so I'm going to talk to Ayrton Jenton for the Dirt Show. You guys are welcome to stay on the Zoom. I'd, I'd prefer it, honestly. Uh, this one will – it'll probably come out the Dirt Show first. Uh, but either way, we'll get them both posted on Thursday and uh, have have a good uh, damn racing weekend. It is loaded on Saturday. We'll talk about it on the Dirt Show too. Uh, but the whole weekend is is setting up to be really spectacular. So I'm excited to see that. Thank you for listening. Thanks again to the Carl Auto Group for supporting us, being our presenting partner uh, in doing all that they do for us. If you need a car, go to them. I promise they'll get you taken care of, especially if you mention me. Thanks again uh, to everyone for listening and I uh, hope you enjoy uh, your racing weekend, whether you're here, Ames, Iowa, Boone, or somewhere else. Uh, but it's going to be a damn fun one. I'm very excited. Appreciate y'all.